Our scripture today is a very brief uh, passage from Hebrews chapter 13, very, verses 1 to 2, very familiar passage. Hebrews 13, 1 to 2, keep on loving each other as brothers and do not forget to entertain strangers for by, by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Gracious Father, I pray that you speak to our hearts today the message you want us to hear, and I pray, Father, that you use me as your instrument, and that, uh, Lord, if there's anything that is not from you, Lord, that we will be able to discern that, and, uh, and Lord, that uh, as different as we are today, as, as many as our different, various needs are, uh, the messages that we need to hear, I pray, Father, that you will somehow speak to us the message that our own heart needs to hear today. Uh, we know, Lord, that you're in the business of making us more and more like your son Jesus. So transform us, Lord, for this is our hope in you, that our words and our actions will be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The last two Sundays in our series on angels, I focused on trying to give you a biblical perspective on those servants of God that we call angels. I pointed out that there are over 300 places in the Bible where angels are mentioned, and they're key to the work that God does in this world. Most of the major stories in the Bible are associated with, with angels in some way. But although they're key to what God does in this world, they're not necessarily like what we've imagined or what we've seen in TV shows or movies. In the first week, I gave you examples of how angels were messengers and warrior protectors or ministering spirits to those who are in need or servants of God or, or worshipers of God, and they're witnesses of God's creation and of God's works of redemption. And finally, we talked about how they were agents of judgment that God uses to execute his judgment. And then last Sunday, we focused on the common misconception that people become angels in heaven. And I said that we are not now and never will be angels, and we shouldn't want to be angels either because the Bible tells us that as a result of Christ's redemptive work that we will be actually elevated to be above angels when we are in heaven with them. So you'll be taking a demotion if you wanted to be an angel. Today's message is not about setting these wrong notions right, as the other two messages have been. Today I wanted to focus on a common verse that we just saw about angels in the Bible, and how I think more than ever we need to be putting this one into practice today in our, in our society, in our world. Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 2, keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Other, that's the NIV version, a more uh, up-to-date version of the NIV says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So it, it, entertaining and hospitality, if you're entertaining guests in your home, it's, it's hospitality, isn't it? So you, you kind of get that. Uh, it's not entertaining like with a hat and a cane and dancing. It's, it's not kind of that, not kind of that entertaining like that. It's the entertaining that, that uh, is showing hospitality to guests. If there's anything that this world needs right now, I think it's to have love for others and that kind of love that translates into hospitality towards others around us. Our country and the world itself seems to be a very inhospitable place right now. And we need this biblically mandated love and hospitality more than ever. And make no mistake about it, uh, they go together. Uh, you can't have love without hospitality, and you can't have, have hospitality without love. They go hand in hand. <clears throat> Excuse me, hand in hand. So today, we're going to focus, instead of setting wrong notions right, we're going to set, a, set a, about making wrong actions right. That's our purpose today. When the author of Hebrews wrote the words of today's text, they more than likely had several key events in mind when he or she wrote, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Most Bible scholars point to several uh, stories in the Bible that they probably were thinking about. And perhaps they were thinking about the story of Abraham. When Vicki and I visited Israel, one of the stops that we visited east of Jerusalem was a place where they have tried to recreate Abraham's tent and show you what it was like in Abraham's time. And they called it Genesis Land. And we rode in on camels. Yes, that's us. 
on a camel. If you saw the minutes before that, whenever the camel is, has this like, you know, it, it kind of jerks you up and it's, it's kind of scary. Uh, you, have to, you have to learn how to hold yourself or it'll toss you right off because they are very awkward uh, getting up. So we rode in on camels and when we arrived, we were greed, greed, greeted by this person who they say was representing Abraham, uh, and he came out, came out to meet us to welcome us to his tent with this little jug of water, and the first thing he offers to do is to wash your hands for you. He pours the water over your hands. That's my friend John Appling, who used to be the pastor at the Springfield Church there on the right. And he, they wash your hands as you arrive to welcome the guests, and you know, if you wonder why you wash your hands, remember, we were riding camels, Okay. That should be enough of an answer for why you need to wash your hands before you go eat. And then he invites us into his tent, and, in, and this is what it looks like inside there. With the, they have kind of a, you know, a rug on the, on the ground and uh, not a lot of furniture. And we gathered around this table, and you might recognize a few familiar faces around that table uh, as we were eating. And, and the food was a welcome, uh, welcome sight on that day after a hot day out in the desert and this is what we looked out at so you can imagine why hospitality to strangers was so appreciated if you came through this desert uh, and somebody offers to give you food and water and a, a shade to get out of the hot sun yeah yeah as far as you can see there's not a plant in there's just nothing in that whole picture there and that's what we were looking out at in this and this is just a few miles east of Jerusalem. So you can see how important hospitality was in Abraham's time. And Abraham became very famous for it. Now, whether or not Abraham's hospitality was anything like what we saw in Genesis land, I don't know. But I do know that Abraham was known for his hospitality and famous for it, probably because of the story found in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. In that passage, you read, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my lords, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed, and then go on your way. When Abraham would later discover, was what he would discover in, in a few moments, was that these three men were actually messengers from God. They were angels, and they came to tell him that he and his wife, Sarah, who was, I think, like 86 years old at the time, were going to have a child named Isaac. They named him Isaac because Sarah laughed when she overheard it from the next, on the other side of the tent flap. She was listening in, and she heard him say, you're going to have a child, and she laughed, and so Isaac means laughter. And that's why the baby was going to be named Isaac. And they told him, your son is going to, uh, you're going to have many descendants. And uh, your descendants are going to be like the sands on the seashore or the, the stars in the sky. You can't count them all. And you will be blessed and you will be a blessing to the world. Abraham entertained angels that day without being aware of it. Another story in the Bible that the writer of Hebrews might have been thinking about was the story in, uh, of Samson, which is, I guess there's a show playing in Branson right now about Samson. Samson's mother and father will meet an angel one day. In Judges chapter 13, a strange man approaches the father, Manoah. And in Judges 13, verse 15, Manoah said to what we now know as an angel of the Lord, we would like for you to stay with us until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was an angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? And he replied, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flames blazed up from the altar toward the heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flames. And seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. And when the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was an angel of the Lord. So Manoah had shown hospitality to an angel without realizing it. 
Abraham's nephew Lot maybe carried on the family tradition of hospitality. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 3, you read his story. Two angels arrived in Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting on the, in the gateway of the city. And when he saw them, he got up to meet them, and he bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered the house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. What Lot didn't know was that at this time he was entertaining angels. And the next day they would save his life and his family's life. One more final example of someone who was visited by an angel and that didn't know it at the time of meeting was Gideon. He, he had a visitor come to him when he was there at his wine press, uh, and he begged the visitor to stay with him and let him fix him something to eat. And the visitor said, I'll, I'll wait here with you. And when he returned with the food, Judges chapter 6, verse 20 says that the angel of God said to him, take the meal that you provided and the unleavened bread and place them on this rock and pour out the broth on top of it, which you, well, that would make it sound as soggy. And Gideon did so. And with the tip of his staff, then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire flared up from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. And when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he said, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So Gideon also entertained an angel unawares. Again, our scripture for today, keep on loving one another as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have entertained angels without knowing it. In his commentary on the book of Hebrews, William Barclay points out that the circumstances that the early church were facing at the time that this was written make it especially meaningful when you consider that. It was a time in the church when there was so much of a threat of persecution that Christians were being hunted down and arrested and thrown into the arena where they would be torn apart by lions for the entertainment of the people uh, that wanted to see that sort of thing. And, and so Christians uh, were going through a really tough time. And, and they were dealing with the fact that sometimes they were disappointed by those in their own midst who cracked under the pressure and and did not keep the faith, and maybe even betrayed one another. And so it, it would be easy to be kind of bristly or judgmental or harsh toward other people when that's the climate you're living in. And so the writer of Hebrews reminds them, keep loving one another. Show hospitality. So many of these Christians, when they traveled, and, and of course, if someone's trying to kill you, traveling is a likelihood you know, you're, probably, you're going to get out of Dodge, right? So when they traveled, they, they had a the problem of where you're going to stay. Inns at that time were notoriously bad, filthy, uh, dangerous places to be. And innkeepers, literally, historians of the time, equated an innkeeper to prostitutes. So it's not a reputable place to go. And if you're a Christian, you don't want to go to an irreputable place where people might find it kind of to their advantage to turn you in to the authorities for being one of these crazy believers in Jesus Christ. So they needed some place hospitable. And so he was, he was calling upon them. And, and William Barclay says that there actually was, at this time, something they called guest friendships, where families who maybe have been out of touch with each other for a long time would still have an open door to, to one another. And you just show up, and they will provide you accommodations and, and take care of you so you didn't have to go risk your life in some other dangerous place. Love and hospitalities were things that the world really needed then. And what I'm asking is, don't you think love and hospitality are things that the world needs right now? Today's text reminds us that they are the responsibility of each and every Christian. And further, it points out how we are doing on providing these is under constant review. We're being watched. Last Sunday, Melody sang a song by Amy Grant that states, he's got his angels watching over me every single day. And that can be very comforting, but it's also kind of creepy when you think about it. You know, your private moments, dancing around in your underwear in the morning, you know, you know you're know, you all the time. And I think when I, when I first heard this expression, entertaining angels, I thought, my goodness, you know, you know, 
I bet I would give them a, an, ear, an eyeful, you know, every day when, with my silliness when nobody's watching. Billy Graham says, how would, you like to, uh, how would you live if you knew that you were being watched all the time, not only by your parents, your wife, your husband, or your children, but by the heavenly hosts? The Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 9 that angels are watching us. Paul says that we are a spectacle to them. He says The actual words are, we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as men. This is from Billy's uh, book, God's Secret, Angel, or Secret Agents, Angels. He says, the angels have walked, watched the walk of each believer as the Lord worked his grace and his love and his power in their life. But what are they thinking, he says, as we live in this world's arena? Do they observe us as we stand fast in our faith and walk in righteousness? Or may they be wondering at our lack of commitment? Our certainty that angels might right now witness how we are walking through life should mildly influence the decisions we make. God is watching, and his angels are interested spectators, too. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 does clearly state the Lord will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. So we're under scrutiny. And I confess that when I, like I said, when I read those words, or, uh, we are maybe entertaining angels unaware, I thought of all the silly things I've done, uh, like, you know, when you walk into one room, you're going after something, and you see something else, and you, need, and you grab that, and you take it back, and then you, you think, oh, I forgot, and I've got to go back to that room again to do the thing, and then you get in there, and you know, what was it I was doing here? I can't remember. You know, have you, and I think angels must be getting a, a real kick out of that. But then I also think that I must sometimes break their hearts, too. I imagine what they must be saying to themselves when they see some of the things I do. How can he act that way? after all that Jesus has done for him, after all that God went through to rescue him from his sin, how could he do that? They rejoice, the Bible says, over one sinner who repents and are among the great cloud of witnesses referred to in Hebrews chapter 12 who are cheering us on in this earthly race. Paul wrote to the Colossians, whatever you do, whether it is in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And whatever you work at, work at it with all your heart, as if you're working for the Lord and not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. So I just want to leave you with this question. If we know that God is watching, that the angels are seeing how should we live? How does God maybe speaking to your heart today about something that needs to be changed? Search me and know me, O Lord. If there be any, any unrighteous way in me, cleanse me and make me new. Create a clean heart in me, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we need you. And we need to be reminded, Lord, that what we do matters. And we also need to hear those cheers from the sideline when we go through those difficult times of standing up for our faith or of walking our, our faith uh, in this world. We need to know that you see. And we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Help us, Lord, to live a life that honors you in everything that we do. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.